you today. But why are you here today? Are we here to just say that we came to church? Are we here just to visit with our family and our friends? Or are we here today because we want Jesus to make us a better person? I am hoping and praying that we all are here today because we want to be a better person and that we will humble ourselves to the Lord. I hope that you guys are ready as excited as I am because we are going to have a wonderful study today. And I hope that you brought your Bibles. If you do not have any, we have some Bibles up here for you, but we're going to be going through some scriptures. The title of the message is A Peculiar People. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you as humble as we know how, helping us to understand the words that will be shared today from you. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins. Open up the Bible, Lord, so that we can have a clear understanding and that our hearts are ready to receive it. Not only for ourselves, but for the edification of you and also to win souls on your behalf. We need to share this message with the, with the world, Lord, as you have instructed us to do. But it first starts with us. So, Lord, please be with us. Keep us and guide us. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God's people are a peculiar people. In the English language, peculiar can sometimes mean strange or unusual. God's people are peculiar to the world's way of thinking. However, the word peculiar translated from the Greek New Testament, according to the Strong's Greek Hebrew Dictionary, has nothing to do with being strange. But it simply means being special, set apart, purchased, or saved. So, let's talk about this word peculiar. It says the word peculiar in Hebrew means to shut up as in wealth, being closely shut up or protected. If a person owns something precious or valuable, they will treat it differently than the stuff that does not have so much high a value. They will put it in a place where it cannot be stolen or damaged. Some things are valuable because they are rare. Some things are valuable because they are expensive but some things are valuable because they mean something to the owner. If Jesus is our Lord and Savior, it means he has chosen us. A generation planned and ordained by God, we have been hand-selected. We're unique, a royal priesthood. We're not just simply a servant but we are the sons and daughters of God, a member of his royal family. Amen? We're set apart by God himself. My friends, we are priceless and we are precious in his sight. We have been purchased by God with the blood of Jesus, and we now belong to him. We don't belong to ourselves. And fortunately, brothers and sisters, we have let Jesus down and he is very disappointed in us. Those that have seen the truth, have tasted the truth and have experienced the things of God. We are to teach sound doctrine to those that we come in contact with. How are we doing in that area? To those who are seeking Jesus, we are to teach them and to help them to learn and understand God's commandments. But you know what? We first must do it ourselves. We have an obligation to teach the pillars of our faith. If we don't know what that is, let's study. I would be glad to sit down and teach the pillars of God's faith with anyone. We are to share the reasons why we are Seventh-day Adventists and why we are called to be a peculiar people, a holy nation, separate and distinct from all others that are on the face of this earth. 
What makes a man or a woman peculiar is the fact that we are set apart from all the rest. And God will not set us apart, brothers and sisters, if we are living for Satan and the evil things of this world. Church family, we have to make a deep commitment to God and his will for us. We cannot be bound by sin. We are to walk and talk and act like the people of God, blessed, holy, and consecrated to the Lord. You have your Bibles? Does everybody have your Bibles? Okay, if we have some up here, if you need them, let's turn to our scripture reading. First Peter. First Peter chapter 2. Looking at verse 9. If anybody needs a Bible, raise your hand. First Peter, Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Will. Oh, okay, go ahead. Does anybody else have any other Bibles? Okay. Scripture reading, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says what? But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of what? darkness into his marvelous light. All right. We're here to study, right, brothers and sisters? You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. All right. So now that we have an understanding of what a peculiar person is, let us take a look at the rest of this verse, okay? In Greek... The called out ones represents God's true church. It says called out of darkness. So the called out ones represents God's true church. What are they called out of? Into what? His marvelous light. We have called out of darkness. And we're going to talk about what darkness is. We are talking about his marvelous light. So we're called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 23 says... For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. We are called into his marvelous light, his commandments. Now, the darkness that the Lord is referring to are the evils and the wicked things of this world. It's having the characteristics of Satan and living in sin. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And because no one else has anything to do after this, I'm going to take my time. Is it all right? All right, good. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, let's look at verse 28 and 32. Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, and it reads, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all what? unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, incapable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. This verse, these verses are very powerful because it, it covers everyone. It covers those who commit the things, and it also covers the ones who enjoy other people doing it. 
So if I get pleasure out of seeing sin, I fall right into this category. Let's go to Galatians. A few books over. Chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're looking at verses 19 through 21. Galatians chapter 5. Verses 19 through 21. And I hope that we're really paying attention, brothers and sisters, to these verses because we're here because we want to be better, right? We want to be better. So let's pay attention to these verses. Verses 19 through 21, Galatians 5, it says, Now the works of the flesh, and we're not to live in the flesh, but to live in the Spirit of God are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things, what? Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So let's dissect this for a moment. See, I have always been a firm believer in understanding scripture, understanding the words of scripture. So that's why I use the Bible. I use the Stronger Concordance, the Hebrew Bible, the Greek Bible, trying to figure out what these words mean. Because sometimes we can look at a word and it doesn't mean what we think. I'm going to give you an example. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I have many mansions, right? In our human thinking, we think a mansion is a big old house with 100 bedrooms, 15 bathrooms, That's not what it means in Hebrew. Hebrew means a dwelling place. And I don't care if it's a shack. I will live with Jesus in heaven. So he's not talking about a mansion like we think today. So I'm going to take the time to run through scripture to uh, identify these words when we just read. Because we just skim over the top and we don't know what they truly mean. So let's start. Sins of impurity. So we talked about adultery. This speaks of illicit sex relations on the part of those who are married. Leviticus 18.20 spells it out plainly. Thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. Hebrews 13.4 declares that God will judge whoremongers and adulterers. Fornication speaks of illicit sexual relations um, among those who are unmarried. Couples that live together like husband and wife before marriage are living in fornication. Uncleanliness describes those who may not necessarily commit outward acts of immorality, but whose thoughts and desires are unclean. Uncleanness is reading and watching pornography, telling nasty jokes and stories. It can also be the clothes we wear by revealing too much. Lasciviousness. You see why it's important to go over these words? Have no idea. We, uh, and that's the reason why we study, because we could be doing some of these things and don't even know it. Speaks of uncontrolled sexual lust. We don't have control over our bodies, our minds. Individuals can be guilty of uncleanliness, but when they become lascivious, they become so immoral that they shock public decency by their conduct. One who becomes lascivious has gone so far into impurity that they no longer care about what God or man thinks about their actions. Look, we see it all the time. There are some out here, hetero and homosexuals, that do this. As a young kid, I, you know, I used to see it in the parks. So this is what it's talking about. Idolatry is the act of giving something other than the true and living God the principal place in our affections. Most people in our society do not worship gods of wood and stone, but it it, it is easy for us to set our affections on gods of chrome and steel and glass, paper, money, whatever it may be. Witchcraft. 
is translated from the Greek word pharmakia, which refers to the use of drugs. Today, the word witchcraft or sorcery refers to those who claim to have superhuman powers, ability to call spells, to use magic, and to attain secret knowledge gleaned from evil spirits. Did you know that rebellion is also the sin as witchcraft? Read it in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. Rebellion. Sins of hostility, hatred is a strong dislike, a feeling of ill will toward another person. The Apostle John declares, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Variance speaks of disputes and quarrels that cause discord among the brethren. There are too many church members who are simply not easy to get along with. Many are dreadfully touchy and easily offended. Some are stubborn and bullheaded and just plain contrary. May the Lord deliver all of us from these carnal and wicked characteristics. Bible talks about it, brothers and sisters. Did we know that this, this is meaning? Emulations is a term that speaks of those who desire to be better than others. It is used sometimes to mean zeal or enthusiasm. But here it speaks primarily of having a grudge, resentment, and envy towards someone for their good fortune. Wrath speaks of violent forms of anger. It represents a person with an uncontrolled temper. Such conduct indicates that they are still under Satan's power. Even our tempers, brothers and sisters, getting mad easily. And, you know, we have to have the spirit of Christ. I couldn't imagine myself going through what he did. And he still said, I love them. Getting beat, getting hung, hung on a cross and said, please forgive them. Could we do that? Somebody would look at us crazy and we're ready to fight. Stepping on our shoes or just brush up against us. Brothers and sisters, we have to be a peculiar people. Strife, it describes those who would like to be elevated to a place of responsibility in the church, not so much for their service they can render, but for the prestige it might bring. Some will even manipulate for their own personal gain. Sedition speaks of divisions. This refers to any kind of commotion within the church that causes what is commonly known as church splits. Heresies are ideas that are contrary to the, uh, to the accepted fundamental biblical uh, doctrines of the Christian faith. It seems like some are always trying to come up with something new. All Christians, when listening to teaching and preaching, need to take a lesson from the Bereans who search the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. Envyings, obviously self-explanatory, speaks of resentful desire for one another person's possessions or advantages, uh, which is in the Ten Commandments, right? Murderers, self-explanatory. It is a reminder that taking a human life involves more than stabbing or shooting someone. It is possible to cast looks that are filled with murder. Well, the way we look at somebody, our evil looks, we have to be mindful of our facial expressions. The evils labeled as hatred, wrath, strife, envyings, and seditions are sins of hostility. But we are to have respect for all human beings and a genuine love for fellow Christians. Drunkenness is a condition caused by drinking alcoholic beverages. The reference is to be intoxicated with strong drink. Drunkenness is not a disease, as many people believe. Instead, it's a devastating sin against God. Revelings is a term associated with carousing and debauchery. In other words, wild parties. The best example is probably Mardi Gras. Okay? Sensual pleasures. You know, I remember, man, many years ago, our, our children were young, and we went down to Texas years ago, and it was a place called Deep Ellum. Never heard of it. We just went. And when I got down there, I mean, it was dark around everywhere else, but then this one street, it was completely lit up. 
and it was tattoo parlor, club, tattoo parlor, club. People just hanging off the balcony. And I was in total shock. And I mean, any and everything was down there. I said, let's do a U-turn. I did not know we were going. I mean, we was like, hey, let's just hang out. But I'm thinking, OK. But it was crazy. But these are, this is what it's talking about. These type of parties where, you know, of course, God is not present. Revealings refers to disorderly conduct and celebrations that are typically uncontrolled, loose, loud, frivolous, and boisterous behavior. The only thing that defiles in God's sight is sin. Isaiah wrote, your iniquities have separated between you and your God. In order to live again in the presence of God, each individual must be free from the condemnation brought on by sin. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 25, basically is talking about the same thing. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, brow, proud, blasphemer, disobedient to parents. Huh. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, traitors, high, a heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Do we know what some of these words mean? Well, if we don't, I'm here for you. Lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves, of their own selves is, the, uh, is the plague of narcissism. We see in culture an unregulated self-focus with little moral compass, leading people to live apart from truth. Someone preoccupied with their own selfish desires. You know, um, and if we don't understand even what the word narcissist is, we need to look that up as well. I don't have the time right now, but we need to know these things. Covetous is um, insatiable. That means incapable of being satisfied. Desire for worldly gain. Covetousness is a finding fulfillment, meaning and purpose in worldly things instead of God. The spirit of covetousness leads to and is the mother of many other sins. Coveting another person's spouse leads to adultery. For uh, 2 Samuel 11, 4 and 5. What about boasters? I'm going somewhere with this, guys. Boasting in, in oneself is an expression of pride. Those who sin express arrogance by implying that they can successfully, successfully violate the laws of Almighty God. Paul describes the arrogant and boastful as God-haters, Romans 1.30. Proud, it is self-respect or improper or excessive self-esteem known as conceit or arrogance. Pride can be defined as elevating one's opinions and thoughts above God's authoritative word. Blasphemers. Blaspheme, blasphemy is a religious sense, refers to great disrespect shown to God or to something holy or to something said or done that shows this kind of disrespect. Heresy refers a, a belief or opinion that does not agree with the official belief or opinion of a particular religion. Disobedient to parents. All right. Children that parents can no longer persuade, control, lead, or exercise authority over. And brothers and sisters, this is important. And I find it strange how all these very detailed words, all of a sudden, dis you know, um, disobedient to parents fits right into that. You know why? Because those, the children who are disobedient to parents will also find themselves experiencing the second death. That is the first commandment from God. Our children, we need to obey our parents, for this is right in the eyes of God. I knew you wouldn't agree. Unthankful. The Greek translation for unthankfulness means to refuse to recognize debts, to feel one has the right to services and be without obligation. The attitude in failing to remember that God, that good, the good God has done. Um, 
We all, you know, uh, uh, the unthankful, they said that this is going to be in the last days. We're going to find people who are unthankful. We, you know, we seem to just be thankful when we have the big things. You know, I got a big house. I got a big car. Oh, thank you, Jesus. What about thanking him that I woke up? What about thanking him that my kids are safe? What about thanking him for the small things? We thank him for everything, even for the trials that we go through in our lives. We thank him for why? Because we can learn something from it. If our hearts are purified, if our hearts are ready for it. Not holy, not renewed and sanctified, profane, not hollowed, not consecrated, common. That's what unholy means. Without natural affection. Now, you know, I've studied this word, this phrase for a long time, and some have tried to use this as without natural affection, meaning, you know, homosexuals, okay? It doesn't mean that. What it's talking about is the love, the natural love that we have for our brothers and sisters. Even if they are sinful, even if they are doing the things that they shouldn't do, we still love them, okay? But the words here, the word storage, natural affection, is one of the four Greek words of love. You have agape, eros, and philia. This refers to the natural love that the members of the same family have for each other. We're talking about natural affection, and I'm going to address that a little later. When people lose their instinctive love for their own parents and children, they are without natural affection. That's what this is talking about. Truce breakers. Breaking treaties and covenants with one another, dissolving the marriage bond between husband and wife, making void all oaths, contracts, and agreements among men. False accusers. The Greek word for false accusers, diablos, meaning slanderers or devils. Isn't it interesting, though? This is kind of a side note. I noticed it's like some of the restaurants are using like some of their food and call it Diablo and Diablos. You know, that means Satan, right? I just thought about that. But it's weird that we're starting to use, you know, what, what's wrong with using Dias? That means God in Spanish. You know, I mean, but we won't do that. We're, we're living in that society. It has nothing to do with this. It just came in my mind. Uh, Satan himself is Diablos, the devil, the false accuser of our brethren. And there are today a multitude of people slandering Bible believing Christians, and they are doing the specific work of the devil. Now, I don't know if you guys have heard. And we're going to get into this verse, but. I was doing some research uh, a, a couple weeks ago, and I saw something that really shocked me. Have you guys heard of the Queen James Version Bible? I thought it was a joke. And I did some research. The Bible is printed in all the rainbow colors. It's not the King James Version. It's the Queen James Version. So guess who it's for? The LGBT movement, what they did was they took completely all of the the homosexual um, stuff that's in the scriptures in the King James Version. They took it out of this Bible and said, here, read this. So now we it doesn't mean that or anymore or we can't go to scripture because now they have created their own Bible. Brothers and sisters, you know, another uh, faith that has created their own Bible. OK, is the Catholic Church, the catechism. God has the word of God here. And he says when we alter it or take away from it, he's going to deal with them individuals. They have a Queen James Version Bible. I thought it was a joke, but that's the times we're living in. Incontinent. <clears throat> Not restraining the passions or appetites, but, but uh, particularly the sexual appetite, indulging in lust without restraint, or in violation of God's law without self-control. Fierce means ungentle, rough, cruel, harsh, reckless, impulsive, severe, and selfish, and is the opposite of gentleness and mildness. Despisers of those that are good. This means that they are hostile to virtue and opposed to goodness. They'll despise you for doing and being good. When you do the right thing or uphold God's word and people get mad 
or um, mad or hate you for it. Traitors. This signifies one who believe, uh, delivers up or betrays. This also applies to Judas who delivered up Jesus. These traitors to the faith are not led by the Holy Spirit. The Bible immediately warns us that false, these false teachers, traitors, will come from within the church or as Peter writes, among you. The implication is that forewarned is forearmed. Therefore, be on guard. Heady, high-minded, same thing, thinking better of oneself and worse of others than he ought to think, to be filled with self-pride, in, uh, inflated with self-conceit and arrogant. Lovers of pleasures. Paul used the Greek words uh, philodonus uh, to say that society in the last days will become more um, lovers of pleasures or that they will become preoccupied and obsessed with the pursuit of their own comfort, pleasures, desires, and happiness than loving God. That's where we are. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. When a person appears to be godly, but they do not allow Jesus to have a powerful influence in their lives. God, uh, Paul discusses the characteristics of godliness in the last days. He warns of people who have a form of godliness, but denying its power and gives explicit instructions to do what? Avoid such people. Brothers and sisters, I know it took a little bit of time. I hope that we gained some kind of knowledge because we don't want to be like these things here. So I wanted to take the time to share with you to understand these words. The grace of God has been freely offered to each and every person in here. We only need to accept it. But the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we ready to receive it? Are we ready to, to receive salvation? Are we ready to, uh, for the war that is ahead of us? Are we ready for that war? If not, brothers and sisters, we need to get ready. The Lord has shared with us that he will be with us in the last days when all these things take place. He will be with us during the time of probation. He'll be with us as the four winds will be released upon the earth that is mentioned in chapter 7 of Daniel and Revelation. But I need to warn you, church family, if we're living a life of sin, holding on to it and not wanting to let it go, we're going to find ourselves at war with God and he's going to deceive us. Satan is going to deceive us. He thinks he wants us to believe that we're at war with each other, but we're at war with God because we're not ready to change our hearts. We are to be a peculiar people, brothers and sisters. The followers of Christ are to shed light into the darkness of this world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light and will become a transforming power in the life of all those who receive it. Amen? He can transform us if we allow him to. The Bible says, let's go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah and we're going to look at chapter 60. And let's pay close attention here. Isaiah chapter 60. Look at verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his what? Glory shall be seen upon thee. So, what is God's glory? And is it important? This is something that we need to know, friends. Why? Because it is the glory of God that will save us from this dark world. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 33. We're going to talk about God's glory. Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 
Exodus chapter 33. Play close attention so we can find out what the glory of God is. Exodus chapter 33. Look at verse 18 and 19. Exodus chapter 33, verse 18 and 19. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And this is Moses here asking the Lord to show him his glory. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. All right. Did you pick it up yet? All right. Let's keep on going if you have it. Let's go to chapter 34. Chapter 34, verse 5 through 7. Pay attention. It's revealing to us what God's glory is. Exodus chapter 34, 5 and 7. It says, And the Lord described in the cloud and stood with him there. And proclaim the name of the Lord and the Lord passed before him and proclaim the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious and long suffering and abundant in goodness and in truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children until the third and the fourth generations. So what is the glory of God, brothers and sisters? We just read it. The glory of God is his character. His glory is his character. We have to have the character of Jesus in order to have victory over sin. We have to have the character of Jesus if we want to be a light in this dark world. We have to have the character of Jesus if we want to win souls for his kingdom. My friends, we have to have the character of Jesus if we want to make it to heaven. You see, the Lord sends his ministers, you and me, to a dark world to proclaim the word of life, and that is Jesus, to preach the gospel with the power of God for the salvation of others. So, going back to Isaiah, what does gross darkness mean? It says people will be in gross darkness. You see, through the misrepre misrepresentations of Satan, many will be deceived. They will be worshiping false gods clothed with the attributes of the satanic character that they have. These individuals, brothers and sisters, they're in gross darkness. They are under the hypnosis of Satan who wants to see them destroyed. My friends, the Lord is removing his restrictions from the earth, which are the four winds. And soon we're going to see that they're going to be more. It's going to be more death, more destruction, increasing crime, more cruelness, more evilness and all the workings are going to be against the people of God. And those who are without God's protection, brothers and sisters, we do not want to find ourselves there. We will not have any place to run. We will not be safe anywhere if we're not under God's protection. Brothers and sisters, those who are working for Satan in these last days, they're going to be trained. They're going to come up with inventive ways to kill us. Inventive ways to destroy us, all of God's people. But he said that he will be there for us. What I'm talking about is being a peculiar people, a people that will stand for Christ when times get hard, a people that has self-control and will not give in to the pleasures of sexual sin. A people that would treat their bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord and will stop smoking and drinking alcohol, eating flesh meat, whether it is clean or unclean, and consuming all other things that is killing our bodies. A people that is not decked with makeup and jewelry and gold. A people where the youth is more excited about pleasing Jesus than looking good on social media, trying to impress their friends. I'm talking about a peculiar people, brothers and sisters. 
You see, we are in the sifting time. And God, he is looking for a pure, a pure and true people. But if we're not careful, if we're not paying attention to the warnings of Jesus, we will be sifted right out of the church and will be a part of the second death. Turn with me to Ex- Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Let's look at verse five. This is why we are going through so many problems in our lives, brothers and sisters. It says, now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You know what this means, church family? This means by obeying God and keeping his commandments, we have a special and unique relationship with him. Amen. Isn't that what we want? We are precious to him. And he said that he will take care of us. You see, seven day Adventists above all other people on the world should be a pattern of piety, holy in heart and in conversation. We are to show love to our brothers and sisters. Be humble enough to say, I'm sorry, and ask for forgiveness. And if we're not able to control our selfish passions and desires and our attitudes, salvation will be misunderstood to the world and we will lose out on it. However, brothers and sisters, Jesus has some good news for all of us. We're here today because we're wanting Jesus to change our hearts, right? Is that why we're here? We're wanting Jesus to change our hearts. So there's not one person in here that is so low. One person in here that is so corrupt and so vile that they cannot find Jesus who died for all of us in here. If we put away our sins and stop this destructive course of iniquity, and even to refuse to show the very appearance of evil, to show the very appearance of evil, and turn to God with a surrendered heart. He will give us strength, he will give us purity, and he will give us righteousness. I'm talking about a peculiar people. I'd like to share this quote from you um, with you from Councils on Health, this page 567. Listen to this. Not all who profess to keep the commandments of God possesses their bodies in sanctification and honor. The most solemn message ever committed to mortals has been entrusted to his people and they can have a powerful influence if they be sanctified by it. They profess to be standing up on the elevated platform of eternal truth, keeping all of God's commandments. Therefore, if they indulge in sin, if they commit fornication and adultery, their crime is of tenfold greater magnitude than it is of the classes that I have just named. We do not acknowledge the law of God as binding upon them. You know what this is saying? When we have the truth and we're supposed to share the truth and be examples of the truth. And when we go outside of the truth and start living as the world, our crime is tenfold. Why? Because we have lost everybody around us that's looking at us. What example are we going to be? It says tenfold of a crime because we have also helped other God's people, his children, his sons and daughters to be lost just like us. But we're supposed to be Christians. We're supposed to be a peculiar people. But we're denying the power thereof. Deuteronomy chapter 14. Turn there with me. Deuteronomy chapter 14. I am so thankful for everyone who is here today because you have expressed 
you have expressed to Jesus that you want him to change your heart. Amen? Deuteronomy chapter 14, look at verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 14, looking at verse 2. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Now, let's go over to Deuteronomy 26. Deuteronomy 26. Looking at verse 16 and 18. I'm, gi I'm, I'm, I'm giving you these verses to go back and study, not just to read them in your hearing. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 16 and 18. This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes, commandments, and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thy heart. Are we keeping his commandments with all our hearts? If we don't know what his commandments are, we need to study. We need to study. He's saying, if you do my commandments, I will bless you. I will keep you and I will help you. Wouldn't it behoove us to know what his commandments are? Brothers and sisters, come on. If we are lost, it is no one's fault but our own. Verse 17, thou hast avouched thee, Lord, this day to be thy God and to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken unto his voice. We need to listen to his voice. We need to be still and listen. The first thing that we need to do, especially when we're coming up a, against a, a trial or something that, you know, we're going through is to get on our knees and pray and say, Lord, help me. I want to listen to your voice. Why? Because, you know, when we make decisions, we mess everything up. But God is saying, just wait, 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 wait. Wait, let me let me help you. DJ, you're moving too fast. Just slow down. And he's asking, just hearken unto my voice. Listen to my voice. But brothers and sisters, I'm going to make it plain right now. We can't listen to his voice if we're holding on to sin. We can't listen to his voice when we're putting poison in our bodies. We can't hear his voice. God created us. He knows what's best for us. Don't you agree? But we want to do things on our own. We want to do things because we know what's better for us than God. Uh-uh. I don't think so. And as parents, I'm guilty. I tell my children when they were younger, you're going to do exactly what I tell you to do because I said to do it. And then I can't be that way with God. Verse 18, and the Lord hath vouched thee this day to be his peculiar people as he hath promised thee and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 28. So now after reading these verses, let's I, I want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. He has called us to be a, a, a peculiar people. He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light to do what? To be an example to the world, to preach the gospel, to share the word of God, to be an example to our family, our friends that that we come in contact with. Hasn't he called us to do that? He said, a peculiar people, I've set you aside for a specific purpose, and that is to share the last day message, the message, the three angels message of Revelation 14. He's called us to be a peculiar people. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Look at verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 28, look at verse 13. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. And if thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and do, uh, to, excuse me, to observe and to do them. You see, God promises that if we remain obedient 
to his law. We will be leaders in this dark world. And not followers, but we will be the head. The problem with so-called Christians of this day is that we want to do what the world does. That's why you see all this influx of, of just worldly things coming into the church. We can't be like the world if we are saying that we are the true followers of Christ. But if we choose to turn our backs on God, we will then become a follower and not a leader. We have become the tail. And what, he, what has he called us to do as a peculiar people? He wants us to be the head, not the tail. We are to go forth before the world teaching the gospel preaching and living the truth as Jesus has instructed us to. And see, this whole thing, we see the fulfillment of this blessing when Israel became a, a world leader under the reigns of, of David and his son Solomon. But the curse of this fulfillment when the nation of Israel was carried away into exile. Because they were the head, but then they started following all the traditions of the world. And what, guess what? They became the tail. It's the same thing happening today. We are not to be a tail in this world. We're to be the head, meaning we're to live the life that Christ has asked us to live. We cannot say that we are Christians if we're living in the world. Who are we, my brothers and sisters? Who are we? Are we the head or are we the tail? We have to make a decision. As I close this message, I would be remiss to share with you the character that we need to have, the character that we should have as a peculiar people, and that is the character of Jesus. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Looking at verse four, uh, 22, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, we all know it. We've read it before. Do we really truly know what it means? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love. You know, we talked about love, but this love is the agape love of Jesus. And it's so interesting. Do you know God is a God of order? He put love first in here because if we don't have love, all the other stuff will not matter. Love, joy, peace, <coughs> excuse me, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. So when we're in Christ Jesus, we put aside our, our, you know, our fleshly lusts. Whether, whether, you know, no matter what it is, if we know it's wrong and our flesh is pulling at it, we need to get rid of it. We're not to live in the flesh. We are to live in the spirit of God. If we, in verse 25, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So what do these words mean? Of course, I took the time to go through the negative words. I got to take time to go through these positive words of Jesus Christ. The fruit of love. Greek has multiple words of love, including eros, which is passionate love. That's more so between a husband and wife. Uh, storage is a family love, like with our children and our parents. Philios is a brotherly love, you know, between brothers in church or, or sisters in church. And agape is a perfect love that only God can give. Love for God and others results from receiving God's perfect agape love. When we have God's love in us, I can love you no matter what you've done to me. No matter what I'm going through, I can always love you. That's the love we're talking about. See, these are, you know, this unconditional love is what God is. That's the agape love, no matter what you do. And as human beings... Aside, you know, like our children, we probably have agape love for them. No matter what they do, we love them. You know, but people that we see, our spouses, you know, it gets really, you know, we get out of this agape love. 
We're supposed to love no matter what we're going through, no matter what is done to me. I still have love for you. Do we have this kind of love? If you really need a good understanding of what the biblical definition of love is, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Read the whole chapter. It'll tell you exactly what love is. Because we sometimes have a wrong definition of love. Okay? The fruit of joy. Joy in this passage is often translated as joy of delight. It is the realization of God's favor and grace in one's life. Biblical joy is happiness that is not dependent on our circumstances. That no matter what we're going through, I have joy. I could be going through the worst thing in my life, and I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, I've experienced it, and it is nothing better. Going through some hard times in your life and you can still find joy, that is because the love of Jesus is in our hearts. You know, Jesus was on the cross hanging there, dying for you and me. And he still had joy enough to say, forgive them, Father, for they not know what they do. He had joy in the midst of what he was going through. Why? Because he had his father's love. He had that agape love. Peace results from allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and minds. When we have peace, we do not fear or worry about our finances, our safety, our salvation, and our eternal life. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is seen in the peace that comes even when our circumstances are far from tranquil. (laughs) If you've not experienced this kind of peace and love and joy, you're missing out. You're missing out. I, had, I, I praise God that I'm able to experience these things. Long suffering. What is long suffering? Talking about having patience through the Holy Spirit. It empowers believers to withstand challenging situations with perseverance and endurance, especially before indulging in our passions or becoming short tempered. Gentleness conveys the meaning of moral goodness, integrity and kindness. Romans 2, 4 reminds us that God's mercy and grace should lead us to repent a uh, repentance, not judgment. The Holy Spirit enables us to have moral integrity with gentleness and not get trapped in self-righteous judgment. Goodness is seen in our actions. The word relates to not only being good, but also doing good things. Through the Holy Spirit's work in Christian lives, they are upright in the heart and do good things. Faith. Faithfulness is evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Faithfulness is a character trait that combines uh, dependability and trust based on our confidence in God and his eternal faithfulness. Brothers and sisters, we we had a good conversation about faith last night. And I'm going to tell you, we need to have it. Without this, without faith, we're dead. What do we have our faith in? Is it in ourselves? Is it in other people? Is in, what is it in? Is it in our, our careers? What is our faith in? Meekness. Meekness does not identify the weak. Because a lot of times people will say, when you're humble and you're meek, then you're, you're weak. That's what they, the, the, the world, that's what they believe. But more precisely, we're strong. Why? Because we can control ourselves. You're, we're strong enough when we can control our actions and our thoughts and even our words. OK, who have been placed in a position of weakness where they preserve without giving up. Temperance is the ability to control one's body and its sensual appetites and desires physically and mentally through the power of the Holy Spirit. Temperance relates to both chastity and sobriety particularly moderation in eating and drinking. Temperance is the opposite of the works of the flesh that indulge sensual desires. Last scripture for today. Titus chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a what? 
a peculiar people zealous of good works. I like for everyone as we close, all heads are bowed, eyes are closed as we go to Jesus. The simple fact, brothers and sisters, we shall feel honored that God has chosen us. But we cannot be a peculiar people when we don't come to church. We cannot be a peculiar people when we're not studying our Bibles. We cannot be a peculiar people when we're not spending time with Jesus throughout our day and having devotion on a regular basis. We cannot be a peculiar people if we're not at least trying to have victory over sins in our lives. Right now, brothers and sisters, I'm urging you, my friends, let's prepare for the soon coming of Christ, that we may be among those who meet him in peace. Amen. So if you want to take a stand today and do not worry about who's around you, if you want to take a stand today and give your heart and your life to Jesus to be his peculiar people and to be baptized and or even rebaptized, I'm asking that you please come down front and meet me. If there's anyone that you want to give your life to Jesus today, don't hesitate. Is there anyone? I want you to come down front and give your life to Jesus today. We are at that time, brothers and sisters. We cannot hesitate. We cannot wait because Jesus is coming very soon, whether we like it or not. And if we want to see Jesus in peace, I'm asking you to come down front and give your life to Jesus today. Is there anyone? If you want to be rebaptized, Maybe there's some things that we need to get straight in our lives. Maybe there's some things that we need to give up, young and old. I don't care who you are. If you need to give your life to Jesus today, I'm asking you to come down front. The simple fact is, brothers and sisters, we can walk out of this church. And if we haven't surrendered all to Jesus and something, God forbid, happens to us, will we find Jesus in peace? Will we find Jesus in peace? Is there anyone? If you're wanting special prayer, I'm asking you to come down front. If anyone is wanting special prayer, I want you to come down front. You. Come down front. If you're wanting special prayer, I want you to come down front today.